All right, how's it going? Good. So questions? Yeah. yeah. On the ODB 12, whenever I went to test it, I kept getting one of the tests wrong. I was getting four, I was getting 10 out of 10, mm -hmm. except for one. And I went through all the test scenarios. And okay. whenever I ran my test program, I worked on all of the scenarios. Tried with a zero. I did try with a zero, and it returned zero. Zero is not positive. Oh, it was out, and that's probably one. Okay. So yeah, if it wants a positive number, it's got to be bigger than zero. Negative is less than zero, and zero is not positive or negative. It's just one of those things. <laughs> All right, so a bunch of things I want to talk about. I want to start with a shout out for um, Clark Aerospace Club. How many people here are familiar with the Aerospace Club here? Okay, this is an awesome club. Um, they, they design and build rockets, and then they test them out. They drive them out to the desert, and they shoot them up into the air, and they'll go a few miles into the air and they'll come down and hopefully they recover them intact. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they blow up. Um, and then if it survives their testing, they go and they enter them into competitions and they compete against schools like, like Stanford, Caltech, right? Um, and historically, they do really well in these competitions, okay? This is, this is a ridiculous amount of fun if you're into this kind of thing. It's a great amount of visibility Right, because you're working side by side for a few days with people from these big name universities, with people from NASA, um, with people from industry. It's exposure, it's a chance to build a network, and it's, it's a pretty cool opportunity. So they have two competitions they're working on this year. Um, one is their um, rocket launch and payload competition. So typically, they have to design a rocket within certain specs. Um, and they have to fly it to a certain altitude. And the goal is to try to hit that altitude exactly. So if they're trying to get to 10,000 feet, it should go to 10,000 feet. If it goes too high or too low, they lose points, right? So you're trying to, to um, hit a certain altitude. And it's got to carry some kind of payload, which may, for example, be doing uh, recording of certain information, altitude, um, acceleration, things like that. Um, and then when it comes down, it has to deploy a chute and land safely, and it's usually got to find some target and navigate itself to land within a certain distance of that target, and then you can download the data that are recorded, and that gets analyzed, and so on and so forth. So that's one of their competitions. Um, the other one is this autonomous drone slash rover competition, and this is um, responding to a call for designs for um, I think it's an autonomous system that can do mining on, say, an asteroid, right? So this is something NASA is interested in because it's really expensive to shoot things up from the Earth into orbit. It's relatively cheap to mine things that are already up there, like asteroids. So if you're just trying to get raw materials, if you want to send them up for however many, you know, thousands of dollars per pound it costs, or do you want to try to mine them? So, um, so they're working on an entry for that competition. So drones and bots and space, right? Uh, but do you need an atmosphere if you're just trying yeah, to mine? If you're what? I could not use a drone that used propellers, yeah, but you that's could. What they're doing now. Well, I don't know what the drone part of it is then, um, but I thought the rover part was was for an asteroid. But yeah, you're right, that makes no sense if, if you don't have an atmosphere. So I don't know where the drone comes in. Um. So um, they meet over in AA4, room 204. Um, Wednesday is the meeting for the payload competition. Tuesday are meetings for the, the drone <coughs> rover competition. Um, and chances are, if you go over there at any point during the day or maybe the night, Room 204, you'll see people in there working on this stuff, and they just say, hey, I'm a computer science student, I'm kind of curious about what you're doing here, right? They'll probably, um, you know, throw gifts and candy at you or something. Because <laughs> they need engineers, they need computer scientists, okay? This is a lot of mechanical engineering, this is a lot of, of civil, those kinds of things. Um, but generally, they're really, really hungry for computer science expertise. 
and you are computer science experts, right? Particularly compared to what they have, <laughs> right? Um, so, I mean, throw a Raspberry Pi in there. Well, you've all worked with Raspberry Pi now, right? You're going to be working with it in your labs. Um, but it's Unix. And you know Unix. You can write scripts. You can write C code. We're starting to play with GPIO so we can interact with the outside world. That is dynamite, right? That's, that's the kind of control that they need to be able to do things like interact with hardware, deploy systems, read things from sensors, stuff like that. Um, and I think there's a fair amount of kind of low-hanging fruit that is going to take them just a really long time and you could probably get up to speed pretty quickly. So if you're interested, if you're curious, right, I suggest go to one of their meetings if you can or just go over there and start talking to people and see if there's anything there that you're interested in. Um, it can be a great opportunity for networking um, and, and sort of building up a, uh, a network of contacts and that's always useful down the road when you're looking at more schools, when you're looking for a job, internships, things like that. So that's my little shout out for aerospace. <coughs> Are you affiliated with the aerospace club? I'm looking for the club. Okay, okay. Cool. All right, so let's talk about ODPs. So I, I posted some info from um, IT on how to get on the 5 gig network from an Android device. From Windows, um, according to Rezod, you basically go to your network settings and you can specify uh, which one you want to use. From Linux, I have not been able to figure out an easy way to, um, to force it onto one network or the other, but, um, but if you do iwconfig, it'll tell you where you are and I seem to always be on the 5.2 gigahertz system here so I think it probably goes for the fast one if your adapter handles it which probably all adapters do um, but I yeah thank you thanks so if you do IW config um, it'll tell you what frequency you're on and I seem to be getting dropped regardless but um, are you what? I get dropped on Linux too all the time. Okay. Yeah, try IWconfig. See if you're on 5.2 or 2.4. And um, and if you're on 5.2 and you're getting dropped consistently um, from Wi-Fi, I would say go ahead and shoot an email to IT. Okay, now don't tell them my teacher, Nick Macias, said that I should write you and complain because the Wi-Fi sucks. Okay, don't do that. <laughs> but, but you know, as a student, you should have Wi-Fi access as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Right? And it should be pretty reliable. And if it's not, and if you're using 5 gigahertz, right, I would suggest sending a polite note to IT and say, you know, hey, I'm trying to use Wi-Fi in room 156, I keep getting dropped. More information is better, right? During the 50-minute class, I got dropped five times, that kind of thing. Um, where are you from there? Um, should be on the Clark website somewhere. If you go to IT or technology or one of those, find a contact us. Um, and more detail is better. And and I think the more students they hear from, the more seriously they're going to take it. Right. Um, I talked to someone who worked for uh, in Congress once, and they said if if someone in Congress gets twenty letters on a subject from people, they start to panic, right? 20 letters. That's how little people sort of like actually write to their congressperson. Um, so I don't know what the threshold is for IT, but I would think that, that if they start hearing from students um, with information that, you know, documents some kind of situation, I think that'll probably help. How would you change the you hertz on Android? I posted it on Canvas. I didn't read through it. Oh, okay. It's, it's there's so many ways you can find settings and options, so I don't remember. But I posted verbatim what they what they sent me. It's just a PDF.
All right, so um, so ODP 411 um, had lots of, of emails from people having issues with this. Um, so a few a few comments, sort of summarizing the things that I saw. Uh, first thing is parse is a function that takes one argument. Okay, it's a character array. It's a string. It's a single argument. Okay, so you cannot call it with an integer. You cannot call it with a pair of arguments. You can't call it with a string followed by an integer, right? Some of these things will compile. Some will compile with warnings, but they won't do what you want it to do. Okay, when you assess, it's, it's not going to be happy with that. So it's got to take an array of characters, and it has to return a single integer, okay? So terminology again, right? And I'll try to be consistent about this. Um, there is no input to the parse function, okay? It takes an argument, but I'm not gonna use the word input for that. When I say input, I'm usually thinking of reading from standard in, f gets, or in bash, the read function, or something like that, okay? This car star, this thing that you put in parentheses when you call parse, I'm gonna call that an argument to the function, okay? It's kind of like a value that you're giving to the function, kind of like input, but I won't call it input. Okay, this int before parse means parse is going to return an integer. I'm not going to call that an output. When I say output, I mean usually printf, something that appears on your screen or standard out. This is a return value from the function, okay, or the function's return value. And somewhere in parse, if you say return parentheses some number, that number will be the return value. And if you call parse by saying x equals parse, right, that number gets assigned to x. Okay, so that good? All right, so what the function does is it takes this string, this argument, okay, accepts a string is another way of saying it's, it's a command line argument, or a, a function argument. It accepts the string, uses scanf to try to convert it to an integer, and then returns a value based on the following. Um, in all other cases, meaning if it was not able to convert it to the integer one, two, or three, because perhaps it wasn't an integer at all, right, it should return minus one. So if the string's empty, if it doesn't start with a digit, et cetera, return minus one. Okay, so here's a version of parse. So I include stdio because I'm using a scanf, and it'll complain if I don't prototype it, and the prototypes in standard io.h. So there's the declaration of the function, integer parse parentheses character star, and I need to name my variable, okay? If I'm prototyping, I, just, I can say car star parentheses semicolon. Because when you prototype a function, when you do this thing up here, you're not writing the function, okay? You're telling the compiler, here's a function I'm going to use. The code is somewhere else, but the compiler needs to know what is it expecting, what are the arguments, and what is it returning. Okay, so I could say car star arg, but the arg is completely frivolous. It doesn't do anything with that. But when you actually write the function, as usual, you need to actually say what that argument is called. And now, anywhere in this program, when I use the variable arg, it means whatever was passed to this function. All right, so pair of integers, and then my call to s scanf, and I'm scanning whatever that argument was that was passed, arg, as an integer, storing the result in i, and then s scanf is returning an integer that I store in ret. Okay, so here's the next thing where there's some confusion. This can flip back and forth pretty easily. There's two things s scanf does. One, it converts its argument, okay, it's, it's arg in this case, to an integer and stores that integer value in i. And two, it returns a flag telling me if it succeeded in doing that or not. So ret is the flag. If ret's equal to one, it converted one thing. If ret's not equal to one, it did not convert one thing. i is the actual value that I converted if it did a conversion. If it didn't succeed in converting, i is meaningless. 
So I want to check i to see if it's bigger than or equal to 1 and if it's also less than or equal to 3. It's an int, so if this is true, that tells me that i is equal to 1, 2, or 3. But I don't want to use the value i unless I know that it actually stored something in there. How do I know that scanf stored something in i? Because scanf will return the value 1. So before I do anything with i, I've got to check this return value. Now in this case, if the return value from scanf is not 1, that doesn't mean that the string had the number 1 in it. Okay? The string could have had the number 518 in it. Ret would still be equal to 1. It's a flag. It's saying I converted 1 integer. If that's not equal to 1, it did not convert an integer. That's my, in all other cases, return minus 1. So at that point, I just return minus 1 and we're done. Otherwise, if I get down to this line of code, I know that ret was equal to 1. So it did one conversion. And now I know that i has the value that it converted my string into. So now I can safely say if i is bigger than 1 and less than 3, just return i. Otherwise, it wasn't a number between 1 and 3, so I'll just return minus 1. So most people had some version of this in their code, but for example, the order is critical here, right? If I do this before I do if ret's not equal to 1, it might just turn out that i happen to equal 2. Not because the string contained a 2, but it might just be that i happen to be equal to 2. And I'd be erroneously returning a 2 instead of a minus 1. <coughs> yeah? Uh, so I see that you wrote down if and then the brackets and then return in one line. <coughs> Mm -hmm. you, can, you don't have to do the brackets to um, Yeah, I recommend always doing the brackets, but I was being lazy in here. Gotcha. Um, the, the only danger here is that you can only have one statement after the if if you don't have brackets. Mm -hmm. And yeah. sometimes you want to throw something else in here and you put it in and it, it's not doing what you think. So I almost always use brackets, but I was in a mood when I wrote this, I guess. Same, yeah. All right, so questions about this? So, so how do we... How do we do something with this? So, so this is this is junk code. This is test code, right? Um, that just exercises the heck out of scanf and lets us try to figure out what exactly scanf does. So, in each case, I'm doing an scanf as a percent %d, storing it in num, and then printing out the return value from scanf that's i, and the value num that I'm trying to store into. And let me get rid of these, these last few things. So let's just look at those. So first I'm going to take the string containing 12 and try to convert that. And I'll try ha ha. And I'll try some space uh, empty string. And then 2, and then I'll try 12, ha ha, and then I'll try ha ha 66. So I'll compile this up. Let's go ahead and run it. And we get the following. So in this first statement, we're trying to scan the string 12 as an integer stored in num. And i, the return value from scanf, was 1. That means it converted one thing. And num, the variable we're saving into, an integer, is equal to 12. That's exactly what we'd expect. 
in the second statement, I'm trying to scan ha ha as an integer and store it in num, and as scanf returned to zero. That means it did not convert an integer. The value of num is still equal to 12. Why? Because it didn't change num. Okay, if it can't convert, if scanf can't convert something, it won't touch this variable. Okay, in the third case, I tried to convert an empty string to an integer and store it as num. And this time, i came back as a minus 1. Okay, our test, remember, is did scanf return 1? Not 1, not 1, that's an error. But it's not always going to return 0 if there's an error. Sometimes it'll return minus 1. So you always want to see did scanf return the number of things I'm trying to convert, which in this case is just 1. All right, then I tried to convert the string 2 to an integer, as scanf returned a 1, and my number is equal to 2, exactly what you'd expect. Then I tried to convert 12 space ha ha ha, and it returned a 1. It said I converted one integer, and it set num equal to 12. That's exactly what we expect. Because what scanf does is it starts at the beginning of this string, and it says I'm looking for an integer. Is this one part of an integer? Yep. How about this 1 followed by a 2? Is that part of an integer? Yep. How about 1 followed by 2 followed by space? No. That's not going to be an integer because integers don't contain spaces. But it found a 1 and a 2, so it'll say, okay, I can convert that to an int. That's the number 12. It stores a 12 in num, and it returns a 1, saying I converted one thing. And it ignores the fact that there's stuff after that. Okay, and as I've said with PA2, you're allowed to do the same thing. You don't have to pick up the fact that you said, how many sticks do you want to play with? And they said 12 space, ha ha. You can take that as a 12. Okay, scanf likes it, you like it, I like it. But then in this last one, it tries to convert ha ha space 66 to an integer, and it returns a zero, saying it did not store anything in num. And why is that? Because it starts here at the h, and it says, is this part of an integer? No. So it didn't find anything that looked like an integer in the beginning of the string. It gives up, it doesn't store anything in num, and it returns something different from one. So does that make sense so far? Right? So if, if you're trying to do your ODPs and it's not working, right, put the ODP aside and start writing some test code. If you're trying to use scanf and you're not sure what it's returning and what is it storing and stuff like that, write some code like this, right? Make a directory called, you know, test code or junk code or whatever and, and just start getting in the habit of writing stuff like this. Because it's a whole lot easier to figure out what's going on with this than it is with one of these crazy ODPs with all these different things you're supposed to do and check and you feed it into assess and it just says, you know, zero out of 10 on test two or something. All right, so let's, let's take a look at this next statement. So now we're going to scan ha ha space 66 and we're going to scan it as a percent D percent D and try to store the results in num and num two. And I is going to tell us how many things it converted and we'll print out the values of num and num two. So what is this going to print out? What do you think scanf is going to return? <coughs> exactly. We're asking it to convert a pair of integers. It's going to start right here at the h and say that's not part of an integer. That's it. It's done. It gives up. How many things did I convert to zero? It's going to return a zero. It's not going to touch num or num2. Even though if it had gone on, it would have seen a 66, and that is an integer, and it could store a 66 in num2. That's not how scanf works. Okay, as soon as it can no longer match the pattern, it gives up. And num2's got this crazy <coughs> number, right? And if I run this again, num2 will have some other crazy number, because num2's never been initialized. I didn't initialize it up here, and scanf isn't touching it, 
because it gave up as soon as it saw the H. So num2 is basically random. It's whatever happens to be in memory when the program starts to run. All right, so let's add one more scanf. And here we're scanning two things, 43666, 2% Ds, putting them into num and num2. And that should certainly work. All right, so it scans two numbers. It returns a value of two, saying, I converted two things. And it stored them in num and num2. And those have the values we'd expect from the string. All right, good. All right, so I've said don't use scanf. We're going to use scanf here for a moment, which you'll notice in a file called bad. <laughs> All right, so infinite loop, it says enter an integer, and then I use scanf to read an integer, store that integer in i. I'm going to print out the integer value, right? That seems pretty, pretty straightforward. So enter an integer, I'll put in 23, and it says you entered 23. That's good. Enter an integer, and I put in negative 9, and it says you entered negative 9. So far, so good. Enter an integer, and I say, ha ha, and it's doing this. <laughs> and control C will get you out of this, but it takes a few seconds to catch up with all the output that's already been buffered. So does this happen to anybody here? OK. <laughs> so, so what's happening? Um, Scanf reads from a string. Scanf reads from standard in. And standard in is like this pipe. And by default, your keyboard is feeding into this, this pipeline. So you type ha ha. And we've got four things sitting in this pipeline, H-A-H-A. -A -H -A. And scanf is basically ingesting things from standard in. OK, so exactly the same setup as with scanf for a string, but we're reading from this, this virtual pipeline. And so we say scanf percent %d address i. So what does scanf do? It looks at the first thing in this pipeline, and it says, is this part of an integer? And it says no, because it's an h. So it gives up, doesn't touch i, returns a value of 0. All right. So we print out um, i, which was whatever the last value of i was, which was a 9. We go back up here. It says enter an integer. And we call scanf again. And scanf says, OK. What's the first thing? Is that part of an integer? That's an h. Nope, it's not. So it returns immediately with a value of 0. i is unchanged. We go back. We call scanf again. It says, OK, here's an h. Is that part of an integer? No. Right? You can see what's going on. It just keeps trying to parse this h as an integer. And it can't. And so it's just going to keep doing that loop forever. So the issue here is that scanf is doing two things. It's reading input from standard in, and it's parsing it. But if it can't parse it, it doesn't actually ingest the input. So this stuff that's sitting in this pipeline is always sitting there. And every time we call scanf, it looks at the same set of characters, and it says, nope, we can't convert that. It doesn't consume any of it. It comes back right away, and so we're stuck in this infinite loop. Now, if we broke this up, if we did an f gets followed by an s scan f, f gets basically reads everything up to the new line, pulls that out of the pipe, throws it into a string, and then s scan f checks that string. The next time we call f gets, this stuff is no longer in the pipeline. It's been absorbed by f gets. 
And if we type something new and hit enter, that will go in. But if we don't, it'll sit there and it'll wait for us to type and hit enter. So the reason I push this is that it breaks up that, that process that scanf is doing into two pieces. And typically, we want to read a line of input, that's f gets, and then we might want to scan it a few different ways. Is it an integer? Is it something that starts with the letter x? Is it empty? Something like that. Process it, and then go back and get another line of input. Right? So that's one reason I say avoid scanf. So we relegate that to functions named bad. All right. So let's talk about arguments to functions a little more. So I'm going to make a main program here, which has an integer called num that I set equal to 5,000. And I'm going to print out the value of num. And then I'm going to call a function named sub, pass it num, and then I'm going to print out the value of num again. And my sub It's just going to take its argument and set it equal to 10. And I'm not having a return type on sub. I'm declaring it as void. Because I'm not saying something equals sub. I'm just saying sub. Right? So it's like printf. We don't use the return value of it. Um, and I'm going to prototype this. So that's my function prototype. And so you can probably see what I'm after here, right? I'm passing num to my subroutine. My subroutine is setting its argument equal to 10. I'm kind of hoping that when I get back to my main program, num is going to be equal to 10 instead of 5,000. There are skeptics among us. So if I go ahead and run this, you're correct, right? My value was 5,000 before, my value is 5,000 after. So what's going on here? Why is it that this function is setting my argument equal to 10, but when I come back, num is unchanged? And num needs to be a pointer to an integer. Right? Yeah. So he said the pointer word, not me. So, so the phrase to remember here is call by value. And you're going to hear me say this a lot. C is always call by value. So what does that mean? It means when we pass an argument to a function, we don't actually pass num, the variable. We pass the value of num. So when we say sub parentheses num, it's exactly the same thing as saying sub parentheses 5,000 or sub parentheses 5 times 1,000. When you get into this function called sub, any of those three calls would look exactly the same to you. Okay? Sub is not seeing the variable num from the main program. It's seeing a number, 5,000, because that's the value of that variable. If I said sub parentheses 5,000, and then in my function I said x equals 10, we'd have no reason to imagine that num would magically change value, right? 
because we didn't even pass num to the function, we passed the number 5,000. It's exactly the same thing if we pass num. Okay, it's just passing the value. Not all languages do this. Some languages are what we call pass by reference or pass by address. And in those languages, if we set this argument x equal to 10, that would actually change the value of num. Okay, c is passed by value. So the way around this is to use pointers. So we'll pass the address of num, and we'll tell our function to expect a pointer to an integer. And in our function, we'll say that x is a pointer to an integer. And down here, we'll say, don't set x equal to 10. Set the thing that x points to to be 10. So when we call our function sub, we're passing the location in memory where num is stored. Okay, We're passing that location by value, but we're not passing the value of num. We're saying num is stored at location you know, 100 in memory. We're passing a 100. And our function says x is not an integer. It's the address of an integer. x is 100. That's where num is stored. And this line that's got the cursor on it says, take the thing that x is pointing to and set that equal to 10. Well, x is 100. That's the address of num. So it's saying, take the thing at location 100 and set that equal to 10. Well, that changes the value of num. So if we run this, right after the call, our number has changed value. And let's make it just a little weirder. Inside our function, let's print out the value of x itself. And let's print out the value of star x, the thing that x is pointing to. And we'll do that before and after we make this assignment. And it'll give me warnings, but don't worry about them. Because I'm trying to print something that's a pointer as if it's an integer, but that's what I actually want to do. So I run this, and what does it say? Inside sub, x is equal to crazy negative 18 million or something. And the thing that x points to is 5,000. And then after we make this assignment statement, x has not changed. x is still negative 18 million something crazy, right? But the thing that x points to is now equal to 10, OK? This crazy number, that's a memory location. That's where, in my system's memory, it has decided to store this variable x. Or this is this variable num, <coughs> right? Because I passed the address of num. And this statement says, put a 10 in the thing pointed to by x, right, at that address. It doesn't change x, though. If I said x equals 10, right, then x would actually change, and I'd probably say fault. But I'm saying the thing that x is pointing to should get set equal to 10. That's why we have this. But x itself is just this crazy number, which is a memory location. So we're going to come back to this in a few days. We're going to start talking about GDB, which is the debugger that we can use to work with our C code. And with the debugger, we're going to be able to sort of see exactly what's happening inside this program as it runs step by step. And this is where we're heading when we get to 222, when we do data structures. It's all going to be about memory addresses and pointers, okay, and, and dereferencing pointers, which is what we're doing here. And that's going to allow us to basically manipulate the memory of our machines however we choose. And we're going to take information, and instead of just storing it in a variable or storing them in elements of an array, we're going to create these complex structures by taking things and putting them in memory and having them point to other things in memory and having those point to other things in memory 
and this is what we're going to call data structures. And that's the whole thing we're going to be doing in, in winter term, is dealing with data structures. But once you are thinking of things in that way, it's a whole different world, right? So we can create these, these structures called linked lists, or trees, or binary search trees, AVL trees, tries, stacks, queues, hashes, heaps, all these, these different structures, different ways of organizing information. And we're gonna basically cobble them together ourselves by hand, but it's going to leave us with a really, really rich way to store information because we're gonna be able to store associations between pieces of information instead of just having 15 variables that we called whatever we felt like calling them. We're gonna have information that's related to each other. Okay, that's a data structure. And that's gonna be everything we do in 222 and that's going to lead us very naturally in spring into 223 when we work with object-oriented systems and then everything will sort of like flow together beautifully. 222, we're gonna be really, really down at a low level. It's almost gonna be like doing assembly language, but it's going to make assembly language suddenly make a lot more sense. So if you think back to 270 as we're doing 222, things will probably start to click. So that's where we're heading with this. We're not gonna do a whole lot with pointers and addresses in this course, um, but, but that's a preview. All right, questions, comments? Yes? I have a question on the uh, OEP portfolio. Cool. It says if uh, an integer is not positive, return negative three, mm -hmm. are we counting zero as? Zero is not positive. Okay. Positive has to be bigger than zero. Okay. And that, that will fail one of the six tests if, if you do zero as positive. All right, so let me, let me wrap up by, by expounding on where we left off yesterday, which was this idea of, of input and output redirection pipes and greater than and less than. Um, so here's, here's my PA1 stick program. So how many sticks would you like to play with? I'll play with 40, and I'll let the computer go first, and I'll just make some random moves. And I lost, computer won. Okay, this always happens. Um, so you're developing your program and you have a certain set of test cases you want to run, right? And you, you keep having to do the same input again and again and again. You're debugging your program and you might have to run it 500 times to get it to work correctly, right? And it's taking you time to put in all these test cases. So here's what you can do. I have a file called inputs, just a plain old file. And it has 20C and then a line of threes, right? And those are the things that I was typing in my test cases to play this game. And every time I run my stick program, I want to tell it 20 sticks, computer goes first, and I want to take three sticks each turn. And at the end of that, I know the computer should win, right? Instead of typing that in every time, I can say stick less than input, and it reads the input from that file instead of waiting for me to type it on the keyboard. So I've got a test bed now. Right? I can make a few of these to test different conditions, and I can run my code, and I can feed this input into it. Right? I used to try to use this to test people's programming assignments, but there's so many special cases that this ends up taking more time. But if you're testing your own code, right, you know exactly what your inputs are and your outputs, right? you can use this to, to sort of standardize the set of inputs you're testing with. So here's another input file input two, and here I've got some errors, right? I mess up on how many sticks I want to play with, I mess up on who goes first, and I mess up a few times when I'm telling it how many sticks to take, but I don't mess up twice in a row. And I can test my program with this and see that it still works correctly. But it generates lots of output. I have to scroll back here to kind of see what I did. But I can take this, and I can take the output, and I can say pipe it into more. And remember, more is a, a program that takes input and displays it one page at a time. So if I do this, it runs my program 
but it stops once the whole screen is filled with output. So I can read the prompt and I can see the first few steps of this. And if I wanted to keep going, I can hit an enter key to go down one line at a time. Or I can hit a space bar to go down to the next screen. Right? And and you get this for free, right? This is this is part of Linux. Right? So any command that you want to look at that's scrolling off the screen, you can just pipe it into more. Right? So here's my PS dash ELF and way too much stuff to read, pipe it into more, and now I can look at it one page at a time. Or I could take my stick program, feed it input to as my, my standard test bed, and redirect the output to a file. And now I can print this file out and I can take it with me on the bus and stare at it or something, right? Or I can mail it to someone um, or whatever. And here's the output of my game. So you have the ability in a Unix environment, right, to choose your source of input, to choose your destination for output. And those can be files or they can be the output or input of other commands. Okay, so that's that's there, and, and again, the more you sort of think about that, the more you'll probably find ways to use that to make things work better. All right, so tomorrow I want to talk about a few more things along the lines of this, ways that we can, we can modify standard in and standard out. Um, we'll talk about a few more commands, and then probably Thursday I want to start digging into GDB and doing some debugging with that. Okay. So pretty much, actually, so I don't know, I know that this is hard to do, but, but I made this tic tac game. Oh, cool. And I was curious, if I can specify it, what would you do?